Hello. Hello there. Hi, everybody. Thanks for jumping in. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing? Thanks for jumping in and joining me live today for today's walk talk, understanding the rapture and the dead in Christ will rise first. Good morning. Hi, hi, hi. Be sure to type in the comments where you're checking in from so that we know where you're at on the globe. Um, just in case you are new to my ministry, my name is Matt McMillan. I am a Christian author. I've written seven books. All my books are available on Amazon in paperback, Kindle, and hardcover. I just recently re-released all of my books on hardcover, so check them out if you get some time. Um, I also have a podcast. I'm recording the latest episode live on Instagram right now in front of a studio audience. <laughs> And I think it's really cool that we can do these live and then upload them to the podcast, which is what I do. So if you want to listen to any of my past podcast episodes, this is episode 251. <laughs> That's a lot of podcasts. When I first started these out, I had no clue I was going to keep doing these, but we're still doing them. And I hope you guys enjoy them. Now, if you're listening on the podcast, please pause the podcast, leave me a review, and then come on back and finish the podcast. If you have never heard of my podcast, it is called Walk Talks with Matt McMillan. You can see why I named it that. I'm just getting my daily exercise. I'm walking and I'm talking. And I try to keep these as simple and as casual as I can. When I first started these out, they were about... 15 minutes and they went up to a half an hour and now they're about an hour. I try to keep them about that on my podcast. Sometimes I go over, sometimes I'm under, but be sure to check out my past walk talks. Maybe there's a particular Bible verse you're struggling with. You can search that on any major podcast platform, maybe a particular topic, maybe something you've heard in church that you're struggling with. I think I can help you out. Um, my ministry is focused on Jesus and you. <laughs> yes, you too. So I want to help you have confidence in who Christ is and who you are and who you are together with him. I'm also on YouTube. Please be sure to check out my YouTube channel. Everything I do on my walk talks, I put it on the YouTube channel so you can see this on every, um, you can see this on you can see my face on every YouTube video I have. If you prefer to see me when I talk, if you don't want to listen to the podcast, maybe you're not a podcast person, but you like YouTube, go to my YouTube channel. You can search every topic and I think I can help you out there as well. Now, um, if you want to contact me, please do not message me on social media. The best way to get a hold of me is to go to my website www.mattmcmillan.com go to the contact page i'll be glad to interact with you there now while you're on my website be sure to sign up for the free daily devotional maybe some of the things i'm saying is interesting to you um my audible part of my ministry just started i don't know four or five years ago but i've been writing for um, nearly two decades now um, and i made it official about a decade ago. So I write. If you go to my topics page, you can actually read everything that I've written on my website. All right, so let's get to today's walk talk. Understanding the rapture and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So this is a very interesting topic to talk about. Normally, I will not talk about a subject unless I feel pretty comfortable on it. I have dabbled with this over the years because it's just not the focus of my ministry. The, the, the focus of my ministry is not talking about the end of time or anything scary like that. My ministry is focused on what Christ has accomplished. So if we're obsessing over the end of time, whether good or bad, I think we're ignoring more important issues, which is what has Jesus done for you, which is forgive you at the cross, to you, which has caused you to become a brand new creation through the resurrection, and now what he wants to do through you, which is express himself. And if you are focused on the end of time, 
you can really be distracted, okay? But this is in the Bible. We have to talk about it at some point or another. So the past, I don't know, three, four, five walk talks, I've been doing some eschatology stuff, mainly because I want to help remove all fear about the end of time. And normally when you talk about the end of time, all fear is not gone. As a matter of fact, it will actually increase. So why is that? So let's talk about that today because talking about the end of time should be very comforting. <laughs> First Thessalonians 4.18 says this, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. And he just talked about the return of Jesus. In verse 16 and 17 it actually starts up in verse 13 okay so we're gonna dive deep into 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 today we're gonna talk about Matthew 24 Luke 21 Luke 17 Mark 13 and we're gonna discuss the rapture <laughs> and the end of time and the dead shall rise from their graves it might be scary but it doesn't have to be. As a matter of fact, it shouldn't be scary. If you have grown up in a environment, an environment that does not make a big deal out of what Christ accomplished at the cross, which is completely forgive you, it's gonna be hard to understand. Your conscience could be seared by error. Your conscience can be trained by anything. Your conscience is just what you've heard and seen and been influenced by for so long your conscience doesn't always necessarily determine truth so who determines the truth the spirit of truth <laughs> the spirit of jesus where is the spirit of truth here in you the instant you've trusted in jesus by grace and he will always guide you into peace, comfort, confidence, and a sound mind. He will never guide you toward anything that has to do with fear in regard to your relationship with God. Why? Jesus. The only way you could possibly think of any part of the end of time in a fear-based way is if you are ignoring what Jesus has done. And if you are ignoring what's going to happen when he comes back, because there's nothing to fear. The Bible says this perfect love casts out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. So if you are imagining God coming back and punishing you, you're imagining fear. So if you're imagining fear, you'd be imagining he's going to get me for my sins. <laughs> Just one sin. He would get you. Just one, <laughs> not sins, not sinning one one sin he would get you the wages of sin is death Romans 6 23 sadly our modern church chops up individual categories of sins therefore they they are ignoring the wages which is death for all of them therefore they are ignoring Jesus they're ignoring Jesus therefore you're afraid but the more you dive deep into scripture for yourself the more you're gonna understand you don't have to be afraid because Jesus was already punished. Romans chapter five says you are saved from the wrath of God because of the blood of Jesus. Romans chapter five also says you have peace with God because of Jesus. So that is what you should think about when you think about the end of time. But before I get into these passages about the rapture and being caught up in the sky, harpazo, as well as the dead rising first, I want to present something to you. Think about this. I just, now just picture this, okay? <laughs> I know, this is, I don't always do this, but I just want you to just picture this. Picture this. This is hundreds of years ago. And this is just um, not true, but just something that I want you to think about. Hundreds of years ago, I'm alive. Okay, now hundreds of years ago, I'm alive, I'm a counselor, and I counsel different groups 
of Christians, different individuals, different married couples, and there's no way for us to communicate. They have to write me, I have to write them. That's the only way we can communicate. No, no text, email, phone calls, nothing like that. They write me a letter and they tell me what's going on in their life, whether it be an individual, a couple, or a group. And then I write them back. And then they write me back. And this happens with hundreds of different letters. And then I die. <laughs> and all them people die. And then a hundred years, 150 years later, however long you want to say, somebody finds individual letters that we've written to each other. I wrote to a married couple. The group wrote to me. I wrote back to the group. There was an individual who I wrote to, and I'm addressing instances of everything that the Holy Spirit is guiding me to let you know, now this is how the Holy Spirit wants you to think about this situation, to forgive, to, to, for, for you to forgive, to love, to find a way to make peace, to do everything you can to live at peace with everybody, to, you know, whatever it is that I am saying to them, it's addressed to that individual, but somebody finds individual, not all of the letters, <laughs> just a small percentage of the letters, but they find the letters. They take those letters and they put them in a book. And then they add chapters after naming every letter that I wrote. They name that letter something. They name that letter something. And then chapters they add to my letters <laughs> to somebody else. I did not write these with a title on it. I did not write these with a chapter here, a chapter here, a pause and a chapter. But then they also add verses as in individual numbers to my letters that I'm writing to this person addressing a situation. So they named my letters, they put chapters on my letters, they then put numbers in between each chapter. Then they go from this letter I wrote this year to 10 years later, a different letter I wrote to a completely different group with a different situation. And they, they take three verses from that letter and then they go back over here to this other letter from 10 years ago. They take 10 verses from that letter, but then they find another letter of mine, three years written after that. And then they take two verses here, but then they skip down to a different chapter in my letter and they take a verse out of there. Then they mix it all together. And then they build a belief system on that. Just think about this for a moment. <laughs> so they've taken all of these different parts of my letters where I did not write a name on that letter. I did not write chapters. I did not write verses. And then they mash it together. And then they tell you to believe what they think. And then they get angry at you. And they gaslight you. They threaten you. They shut you out. Based on my letters. <laughs> no context whatsoever. Different areas of different parts of the globe. This is a married couple I was talking to. This is a group I was talking to. This is an individual. And they build a doctrine. Now just imagine that for a moment. Doctrine is what you believe. Just think about that. Now here's the thing. That actually happened. It happened. So when Paul wrote all of his letters, he did not write. Chapter here, chapter here, chapter here. He wrote a full on letter addressing a situation, a circumstance, a cultural issue, a government issue, a family issue, an ecclesia issue. Chapters were added in the 13th century. Over a thousand years after all the letters were written. Not just Paul's letters. John, Peter, James. Everything in the Torah. Everything in the Old Covenant. Everything in the Old Testament. Revelation. 
chapters were added in the 13th century. So when they sat down to read something, they read the full letter until the 13th century. And when they added the verses in the 13th century, it was only so they can find stuff quicker. In the 16th century, a man riding on horseback over in Europe from city to city decided to add what's called verses, which is the little numbers next to a sentence or in the middle of a sentence. Think about that. In the middle of a sentence, add a number or a couple sentences or a few sentences. He added numbers called verses. Why did he do this? So he could find stuff quicker than just looking for chapters. So you got chapters added in the 13th century. You got verses added in the 16th century. Before chapters and verses were added, nobody did what they did in the 16th century. Now here's what they did in the 16th century. There was a group called the Protestant Scholastics and they built a doctrine on proof texting, which is copy pasting chapters and verses. You ever hear chapter and verse, please? Chapter and verse? Oh, chapter and verse? Oh, I gotta see it right here. Where's the chapter? Where's... No surrounding context. Here's some things that you can really get in trouble with if you just go to chapters and verses. If you're just going off chapters and verses, you are to be killed if you do any work on the Sabbath. Death. If you're a woman, you're not allowed to leave the house that time of the month. Don't shave the sides of your beard. Don't touch a bird in a bird's nest. Cut off your hand. Pluck out your eye. Sell everything you have. Go and sin no more. <laughs> so many individual passages where if you just proof text, which is copy pasting scripture, you will come up with an erroneous doctrine because the Bible's letters were not written in chapters. The Bible's letters were not written in verses. So when you decide to copy paste and proof text, this method is called proof texting. The Protestant scholastics started this method of proof texting. And when you do this, you will end up with demonic doctrine. How can I say it's demonic doctrine? Because the devil proof texted <laughs> Matthew chapter four, when he was in the wilderness, how did he talk to Jesus? Proof texted Jump off, your angels will get you. <laughs> Proof texting. And the Bible wasn't even canonized yet, so all the only scriptures the, the demonic realm had to go off of at that time, including Satan, <laughs> was the Old Testament. And we see the Pharisees proof texting. We see Satan proof texting. But the church began proof texting in the 16th century. And here we have a theology called a rapture, which was only created through proof texting. We also have another theology where dead people are coming up out of the grave, which could only be caused through proof texting because you would have to ignore 1 Thessalonians chapter 13 through 18, you would only be able to go to verse 16 and 17, and then you would have to go over into Luke 21, over into Matthew 24, over into Mark 13, Luke 17, and then mash it together. Because there's nothing in the Bible about what we see today and what this rapture theology is. When you read the scriptures without superimposing man-made tradition of proof texting onto the Bible. So, <laughs> so let's, let's start out with this verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel. And the trumpet of God. 
and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Next verse, 17. We who are still alive and are left will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. Now, the next verse is ignored. Verse 18. Let's just keep, let's just keep proof texting here. Verse 18. Now get this. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. When was the last time you were ever encouraged with those words? From 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17 much less the rest of that chapter. When? Probably never. You have probably never, ever, ever been encouraged about Christ's return. And that's what he's talking about here. Christ's return. Now, let's go over the dead rising first, because this is a simple, easy explanation. And then we're going to talk about the rapture, the rest of this walk talk. <laughs> So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What does that mean? Oh, this is people coming up out of the grave, McMillan. You gotta have your body. If you don't have your body, you cannot experience this resurrection. This is why you cannot be cremated. Whew comes in hot like that <laughs> because when you're so frustrated or you're so afraid this is going to be difficult for you so i get it but this is also fear-based teaching based on proof texting if you just go to first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 it looks like jesus is going to come back and uh there's going to be a, a loud shout the uh, uh, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and then there's going to be dead people coming up out of the grave. Well, answer me this. If that's the case, what about Christians who are blown up in wars? They gave their life for you so you could have your freedom. Yet their body is obliterated. What about them? That They don't get a new body? What about those in the early church who were put on display and burnt like a street lamp? They didn't get to be buried. They don't get a new body when Jesus comes back. What about those who were eaten by lions and tigers and everything else that they 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 took these Christians and they used them as entertainment and they they were eaten by animals. They don't get a body? Yeah, they can. They, they can get another body. You think God can't create something out of nothing? How do you think this all got here to begin with? He can. And he will. Because the only way you can come up with the theology of dead people coming out of the graves is if you just go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. That's it. But when Paul wrote this letter to the Christians in Thessalonica, did he write this? First of all, 1 Thessalonians. No, he's just writing to this group. <laughs> what were they facing? the Greek culture around them, but not only that, the Hebrew culture around them, they were being told that Christ had already come or he was about to come. Therefore, they were being lazy and idle. Like, what, what's the point? Jesus already came. What's the point? Jesus is about to come. This is why in the very next chapter, chapter five, he says, you don't need to know about the days and times. Just know it's going to happen like a thief in the night. Oh, I got you, McMillan. Then they'll go over to Matthew 21, or uh, Luke 21, Matthew 24, and then they'll use 
the thief in the night stuff over there. Proof texting. We got a proof text. So let's, we're going to get to that. Let's stay over here because nothing over here in first Thessalonians says anything about Jesus coming back, leaving people, taking other people. Just talks about him coming back. Okay. So what's the context? Keep in mind, this wasn't written in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Paul did not write it that way. Chapters added in the 13th century. Verses added in the 16th century. Therefore, you have to read the whole letter for the proper context. Idleness. Believing the lies of the Hebrew people. Believing the lies of the Greeks. The trouble they were going through. This is why he says, encourage the idol. And in the, in the second letter to the Thessalonians, he says, don't have anything to do with the idol because they were still believing these lies. You don't have to read the whole letter for the context of this particular section. All you got to do is start up in verse 13. <laughs> but I do encourage you, read the scriptures for yourself. Let fear be a red flag that you need to go read the whole thing. Let anxiety be a red flag that you need to go read the whole thing in the next letter. Let any type of pressure or scare tactics be, oh, I'm going to go read the scripture myself. Peel back what daddy taught you. Peel back what great, 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 great granddaddy taught your family. Get rid of that stuff and just read the passages for what they are. And he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. So if somebody is Whoa, trying to make you afraid, you're going to be left behind. You better start behaving. Read the scriptures. Verse 13. He talks about the dead who have already believed. The, belie the believers who have already died. He says, you guys have a hope unlike the rest of the unbelievers. You guys have believed in Jesus. Therefore, those who have already died, they will return with Jesus. They will return with him. So all of your loved ones who are being tortured in Thessalonica, they're going to come back. They're going to return with him. He uses the word asleep. That's another word for dead. They've already died and the dead have risen first. Every near death experience you hear, they float. If you die, if I died right now, I would float above my body and I would see my shell here. The dead who have risen first are those who have died, who have trusted in Jesus. It is not somebody coming out of the grave. You could only get that theology if you proof texted verse 16. <laughs> Read verse 13 all the way down to 18. You will see these are the saints who have already died. They're going to return with Jesus in the clouds. The dead shall rise first. They have risen first. What do you think happened when they became dead? <laughs> no longer bound by time, space, or matter. Absent from this body. Present with the Lord. They will return. That's all it is. And if you think that you can't be cremated because somebody has convinced you that you have to have your body, here's the thing. Your body is going to decay in 50 years in a coffin <laughs> or five minutes in a furnace. And if you think that you have to have your body buried in the ground because of what preacher taught you and because of what this guest speaker taught you, they are lying to you. They are deceiving you. You don't have to leave a big bill for your loved ones. I have literally, and I know what the word literally means, I have literally received multiple emails over the years. Matt, what do you think about cremation? I cannot afford a burial. I don't want to leave a $10,000 bill for my family. 
but I want to be risen from the grave according to 1 Thessalonians 4 16 I gotta have my body listen the flesh counts for nothing this is a shell it is a magnificent the most magnificent creation ever but what matters is what's in here your spirit soul and body are blameless now according to 1st Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 now so if you think that you have to have your body because somebody lied to you your conscience is seared by error you are being deceived deceived doesn't mean you're losing your salvation deceived means you believe in a lie and i'm going to talk about that today when i get into the rapture the elect being deceived but let's go on to verse 17 first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17 and we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. The word caught up here is harpazo. That's what they want to use for the word rapture. But the word rapture is not in the Bible. <laughs> that Greek word right there, harpazo. We who are alive and are left. Think about it. He's talking to the Thessalonians. We who are alive, Paul's still alive. So if we're alive, we're left. When Jesus comes in the clouds with the saints who have already died, we who are alive and are left, this isn't people being left behind. You'd have to go over into Matthew 24, Luke 21, Luke 17, Mark 13, and then shove it in here. Because it doesn't say anything about you being left behind. <laughs> He's saying we who are alive, we haven't died Still alive, we who are alive and are left will be harpazo. <laughs> we'll be caught up. You want to say rapture, go right ahead. I don't care. But this is not the style of rapture which began with John Darby. Now let's talk about a Michelangelo <laughs> of the word, or Michelangelo of the word proof text we talked about proof text and if you're just joining me live be sure to watch this on my youtube channel later or my podcast because i just talked about proof texting and everything that came along with that but john darby in the 19th century he was part of a group called the plymouth brethren the plymouth brethren were masterful proof texters now this rapture theology where you take 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and then you go over into the Gospels and you pull that stuff out and you mash it in together, it started before Darby. So we don't want to just say the rapture theology where people are left behind and others taken is from Darby alone. Because it started before him. However, John Darby was the Michael Jordan of proof texting and oration. He's who made it so popular. The Plymouth Brethren was a group who proof text this section, this section, this section. Oh, we got to go over here to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where he talks about the lawless one. Or you got to go over to 1 John and 2 John, where he says Antichrist. You got to go over into Revelation. You got to get all that. You got to go over into Matthew and Luke and Mark, and you got to pull out the words, Revelation. One will be taken, one will be... Fear. Again, perfect love casts out all fear. Where's Jesus in that? And when Jesus comes back, what are we supposed to be afraid of? Nothing. <laughs> if you've trusted in him, Hebrews chapter nine says this. Now get this. <laughs> if you're afraid about Jesus coming back because of the rapture theology that you've been taught, he will return without reference to your sins. When he comes back, he won't refer to any of your sins. Your rude, aggressive, legalistic relative will <laughs> and they will refer to your sins until the day you die and say you're still going to be judged. Oh, no. <laughs> Jesus was already judged. This is why Jesus said, those who believe in me will not be judged, but have crossed over from death to life. So if you're going to be judged for your sins, then Jesus wasn't judged for your sins. 
And because mm, I'm triggered right now, I, I can feel myself getting triggered about this because Jesus is no big deal to the box church. When we say these things, they immediately say you are giving people a license to sin. Nobody needs a license. <laughs> Everybody sins just fine every day without a license, Christians included. <laughs> so, if you're going to sin, and you are, that's why John says, if any of you does sin, <laughs> that's why James said we all stumble in many ways, you're forgiven. You got to deal with it. You have to deal with the magnitude of your complete forgiveness. Because if you don't, then you will be just like the Hebrew people who refused to believe in this. And they wanted to continue to go to the temple. They were deliberately sinning, looking for forgiveness at the temple. And there is no sacrifice remaining for sins there because they receive forgiveness annually by way of animal blood. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31 says... They were treating the new covenant as unholy. What's the new covenant? Jesus talked about it at the Last Supper. This is the blood of the covenant in my name. What? For the forgiveness of sins. Treating the new covenant as unholy. Trampling on the Son of God. If I say, no, I still got to do something about my sins. That's once for all forgiveness is not good enough trampling on the Son of God, insulting the Spirit of grace. That's why anybody says this is cheap grace. <laughs> I direct them to Hebrews 10, 29. You're insulting the Spirit of Jesus. Insulting, right here, insulting it. Look at it. Hebrews 10, 29, trampling on the Son of God, insulting the Spirit of grace, treating the new covenant as unholy. You think you can do something about your sins, but you can't. <laughs> the only way you can receive the forgiveness is to receive the forgiveness that's already offered out. That's it. If you will agree with this, you will be forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness. All means all. So don't deny it. You don't need to say Christians don't sin. You just need to say, well, I sin, but I'm still forgiven. Oh, but it's not that bad. Oh, no, it's bad. <laughs> one sin is bad. Just one, one thing of unbelief would require Christ to die again. Just one. But we like to categorize them or group them or lump them when the wages of every single sin is death. Gluttony, gossip, murder, homosexuality, heterosexual sins. we like let's get off of it let's get back on this Whew, where was i <laughs> first thessalonians 4 17 okay so we talked about first thessalonians 4 16 the dead shall rise first is the saints coming with jesus in the clouds they've already fallen asleep they have believed you have a hope the unbelievers don't and then he continues and he says we who are alive and are left this is not people left behind this is the thessalonians who would have been alive if Jesus had come back at that time in the first century. You will be caught up in the clouds. You're going to float. <laughs> if, if I was doing this walk talk and Christ came back right now, I would see grandma, I would see mom, I would see Uncle Gage, and they would be coming with Jesus. And I would see them and I would float. Yeah, no, we're not going to. I would float. Harpazo. I would see the I would see Jesus coming in the clouds. Whew, don't know why I'm getting emotional about this. Whew. It's because it's gonna be awesome, that's why. I would see I would if Jesus came up back right now, I would still be here and left. I would be I would be here. You who are alive and are left will be caught up in the clouds with them the saints read chapter uh, read verse 13 down with them to meet the lord in the air we're gonna float we're gonna see our loved ones <laughs> we're gonna meet jesus in the air it's gonna be freaking cool <laughs> 
and we will be with the Lord forever. Now, <laughs> many people will look at this passage and will say, nope, this is the saints who have earned their spot with Jesus. They have endured, and now everybody is left here for the tribulation. We'd have the proof text for that. Nothing here says anything about anybody being left behind. This is the end of time as we know it. <laughs> the final judgment's going to happen. Everybody will stand and give an account, both for the good and the bad, while done in the body. According to what Paul told the Corinthians. Now you can see what I'm doing. I am cross-referencing. <laughs> I am not proof texting. So cross-referencing is good. Proof texting is no contextual basis whatsoever. And it's, it's based on verses. Cross-referencing is you don't even need the verse. <laughs> you just remember, oh, this is what Paul said to the Corinthians. We will all stand and give an account both for the good and the bad while done in the body. Well, <laughs> what's the bad? When Jesus comes back, it's the final judgment. He already said we will not be judged. So if we are going to stand and give an account for what we've done, both the good and the bad, Bad would be bad, bad. <laughs> bad according to God, it would be, whoop, hell, this is not, you're going to, it's not going to be a reward ceremony where Billy Graham gets the gold, Mother Teresa gets the silver, Matt McMillan, you're over here, you just got a participation medal, you're, you're over here, get out of here. Grace does not end on judgment day, it explodes in ways you cannot even ex Comprehend, because here's what's going to happen. You are going to be judged according to what Christ has done. Because something bad is a sin. Something good, your best works are like filthy rags, the Bible says. So when you are judged, you are going to have your arm around Jesus saying, hey, hey man, thanks. <laughs> it's going to be good. But here's the thing. You have already received the full reward, the reward of the inheritance Christ in you right now. So the only thing that's going to happen when Christ comes back, it's just going to be something unfathomably good <laughs> for you. Because that's the hope that you've had in Christ. And you will receive it. You will you'll get, be out of this finite shell. It's going to be awesome. So we who are alive and are left, still here on earth, will be caught up in the clouds with them. With them. <laughs> our loved ones. To meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with him forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Next chat, next verse. It's going to be good. Nothing about a tribulation for anything. Did you know when you, and, and again, calm down, McMillan. Whew. When you search for the word trib, I think I'm like that because this was just beaten to my head when I was a boy and teenager. When you search for tribulation, please do search the Bible. You won't hear <laughs> certain people tell you, go study it for yourself. I want you to go, go to the Bible, search the word tribulation. If you, if you don't know where all the words of tribulation is, go to biblegateway.com, type in the word tribulation. It will list every single instance of where tribulation is. Click on each one, study all around it. Not one time does the word tribulation ever describe a time period. You would have to gaslight. You would have to be aggressive or passive aggressive. Or, oh yes, when the Lord returns, the dead will come up from the grave. And those who have endured to the end and proved themselves, they will be caught up in the clouds with them. And then the tribulation will happen. And then grace ends and good luck. Error. Error, 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 dumpster fires, mm, dung, it's dung, it's proof texting. There's no tribulation as an event, as in an event. Search the scriptures, look for tribulation, search it.
Don't just get mad at me. <laughs> Cognitive dissonance is real. I get it. When you hear this, you're like, mm, I'm going to get you, McMillan. I'm going to make a YouTube video out of you. I'm going to prove that you're wrong. Okay, make your YouTube video. Do it. Stitch me. I don't give a rip and flip. <laughs> but when you get done doing that, please go study the Bible. Study each instance of tribulation. Don't superimpose what you've been taught at seminary. <laughs> Bible. God, stop it, McMillan. Oh. Tribulation always describes great trouble and suffering. That's what the word tribulation means. Great trouble and suffering. And great trouble and suffering has been happening since the garden. Since they no longer believed God. And they wanted the knowledge of good and evil. The legalistic knowledge of right and wrong. So they can say, oh, I messed up there. According to... No tribulation. I did a whole walk talk on tribulation. I'm not going to talk much more about that. Go to my website. No, don't go to my website. Go to my YouTube channel because it's not on my website. Go to my YouTube channel. Search the word tribulation. Search the words endure to the end. Done full walk talks on that. But just remember this. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, nobody gets left behind for any tribulation. Because no, first of all, nobody gets left behind. <laughs> Those who are alive are left when Jesus comes with our loved ones, so encourage one another. It says nothing about a tribulation. They were already facing tribulation <laughs> in Thessalonica from the Jews and the Greeks. All right. Okay, so let's go over to the Gospels. Oh, McMillan, I got you. What do you have to say? <laughs> oh, I get it. I get it. So let's talk about the rapture. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 does not say rapture. It says harpazo. You will be caught up. If you want to say rapture for that, I don't mind that. But just know this. When you get caught up, that's the end of time. We will get a new earth. All sin, sinners, Satan, is demon, Satan and his demons are cast away <laughs> forever. And it's going to be awesome. You know, another thing is, you know, when I first started out this walk talk, I said, imagine if... I pieced together doctrine on individual letters written to a bunch of different people and then got angry at you about it if you didn't believe the same. Imagine if I wrote a symbolic letter to somebody in code and then you took part of that symbolic letter and you created a chart and a graph and you slapped your Bible and you scowled. And you accused. That's what people do with the book of Revelation. They want to turn Revelation into a math problem. Because they want to know when Jesus is coming back. But even Paul told the Thessalonians, the days and times, you don't need to know. You don't need to know. But no, we got to do it. We got to figure this out. We got to, no, this is what this means. No, this is what this means. And then they gotta, they got to go over into this section and get this. Go over into this section and get this and mash it into Revelation and say, Oh! This is why I am never giving anybody any type of rock-solid theology on anything in Revelation. Does it belong in the canon of Scripture? Absolutely! Everything belongs in the canon of Scripture. But you have to read Genesis to Revelation based on what Christ accomplished. So if I am going to cherry pick this part of Revelation, say, oh, this is what this is. And this part, oh, this is what this is. So I try to stay away from that. How do I know this is a vision? The letter starts out saying, this is a vision. <laughs> if it's a vision, you read it symbolically. Is it true? Yes, it's true, but it's a vision. So if you want to turn a vision into something literal, you will end up on with egg on your face or you will be involved in a cult. There's even cults with a Christian cap on it. <laughs> with pro Calm down, McMillan. With prophets. <laughs> prophets in charge. Air quotes, the prophet. <laughs> and then they, they turn this individual into a higher 
platform spot, whatever you want to say, than Jesus Christ himself. And they used parts of Revelation, parts of Matthew, Luke, John, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, what the lawless one. The lawless one is somebody teaching the law. <laughs> what do you think a lawless one is? Just a random bad person drinking, smoking, cussing? No, according to the Hebrew people, the lawless people were those who were not obeying the commandments and the law. Depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. They were just bragging on everything they were doing. Matthew 5 through 7, those who were attempting to follow the law for righteousness. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 says, the law is not made for the righteous. Which brings me over to Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, Luke 17, about what it appears as if Jesus is going to come back, take people, leave others, and then it's going to be a tribulation. There's no context for that whatsoever. You would have to take 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, shove it in there. You would have to go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, shove it in there. Proof texting. Because here's what Matthew 24, Luke 21, also Luke 17 and Mark 13. You know, a lot of people just go to Matthew 24 and Luke 21. He talks about the same thing in Luke 17 and Mark 13. What's he talking about? Oh, daddy said you're going to be left behind because you're doing all that fornicating. No, nothing like that. Doesn't say anything about that. Your daddy's lying. Or he just doesn't know. <laughs> He's talking about the destruction of the temple. He was just asked, when is the destruction of the temple going to happen, Jesus? What's the temple? It is the seat of God, according to the Jews. It is God on earth in a building. Hmm? <laughs> but here we have people who go to Matthew 24, and they say, no, one will be taken, one will be left. And then they'll go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So you'll be caught up and the rest will be left. No, that's those who are alive and are left. This has nothing to do with Matthew 24, Luke 21, Luke 17, Mark 13. Nothing to do with that. Jesus is asked, again, we're not proof texting today. Read all around it. When's the destruction of the temple? Jesus says, when you are surrounded by armies. When Jerusalem's surrounded by armies, that's Rome. He's prophesying about what would happen in the year AD 70, the destruction of the temple and the first attempt at snuffing out the Jewish race. Start it with the Romans. This is not even, this is history. This is not even Christian. This is not even the Bible. This is just history. Read any history book. The Jews invaded Jerusalem. Over a million Jews were killed. Jesus is saying that when you see these armies, you need to leave. He is giving a future prophecy. He is prophesying. So a prophecy, C-Y, is future telling. Prophesy is to speak. So he's giving a prophecy and he's prophesying. When you see this happening, Head for the mountains, he says. Head for the hills. He says, don't go into the city. Don't go into the city. One man will be working in the field, or two men will be working in the field. One will be taken by Rome. One will be left. Why? Because that person was taken and the other one ran. One woman would be grinding at the mill, or two women would be grinding at the mill. One taken, one left. Two will be sleeping, one taken, one left. But yet we go and we say, this is the rapture. The word rapture is not there. You'd have to proof text. This is Jesus saying, hey, Rome's coming. When you see these things happening, leave. If you get trapped behind, if you believe the lie of somebody who says, no, I'm the Messiah, this is how you will endure to the end. This is how you will survive. But we go to this where like, no, after the tribulation, after he comes and he gets you, you're stuck here. And then you got to endure to the end during the tribulation. 
proof texting galore because tribulation is not a time period. This is not somebody sinning less or doing a bunch of good things so that they can endure to the end. This is talking about the Hebrew people who got stuck in the city after Rome invaded. And this is how you will endure to the end. This is how you will survive. That's it. And he says, the sun and the moon and the stars will go dark. <laughs> this same phrase is used in the book of Ezekiel and Isaiah. And this is another phrase that the Jews knew what he would be talking about because this referred to government authorities taking over. The sky is falling. <laughs> it's another phrase for the sun, moon, and the stars being darkened. The abomination of desolation, it would be an absolute abomination if Rome actually went into the temple. They weren't allowed in there. And they did. That's an abomination. It's a desolation of the sacred sanctuary, the temple of God. But we want to say, oh no, this is when the Antichrist sets up in the temple. This is why there's a new temple and the law... You got a proof text for that. You got to go over to 2 Thessalonians 2. You got to smash it all together. <laughs> Can't do it, friends. He even says, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. You think that that's Jesus coming to us. <laughs> it's not. It's Jesus coming in the clouds to the Father. We see this happening in Acts chapter 1. Remember, if there's a coming, there's a going. If he's coming to heaven, he's going away from earth. And he even said, I will go to the Father. And he said, this will happen in your generation. What's the generation? The, the first century. But we go to this and we're like, oh no, Jesus will come back. And this, if you're not, if you're not, if you're, and then all fear, trash, dung, Dumpster fire theology of proof texting galore. He says it will be a very difficult time for nursing and pregnant women. Why? Your baby's going to be taken away from you. You're going to be taken away from your baby. Rome does not want the Hebrew people to be on the map anymore. You are going to be exterminated. Leave. This is not a rapture. There's nothing here about Jesus saying, I'm going to take you and leave others. Does not say that. The gospel will be preached to all nations. What do you got to say about that, Big Millen? Well, what happened in Acts chapter 2? It says every nation was there. <laughs> But so much proof texting based on covenant mixture theology, based on Plymouth Brethren, based on John Darby, based on all of this error, and there's nothing to fear. Nothing. You don't need to go over into Revelation 3. If you're lukewarm, you're going to be left behind, you lukewarm Christians. None of that. Read it all based on the proper context. Read it all based on what Christ has done. And also who you are. And just think, let's, now, knowing all of this, let's, let's hear these verses again. <laughs> Before we hear these verses, just remember this part as well. 1 John chapter 4 says, You can have confidence on your day of judgment because in this world, you are just like him. Who's him? Jesus confidence you're just like jesus yeah but i sin but we're not talking about what you do remember <laughs> your best works are like filthy rags talking about who you are but listen to these verses again knowing all of this proof texting and contextual basis the lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and are left, 
will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, <laughs> encourage one another with these words. So, I hope this has encouraged you today. I hope it's brought to light some truth. I hope it's brought to light maybe some error. But you should always tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? You're righteous. You're holy. You're blameless. You're a new creation. You're a child of God. There's nothing wrong with you. And you are awesome. So always tell the truth about yourself. Always be yourself. Love y'all. Bye.